Hello, my name is Gemma and I'm a theoretical physicist working at the University of Innsbruck, Austria. And today I would like to share with you some of the ideas that I find most beautiful. And they have to do with how simplicity leads to universality. Now, some of the ideas are proven, so there are theorems behind them, but some others are intuitions that we are trying to make precise in our daily research together with a really good research team. So to this end, I would like to start with an observation. And that is that simple rules can generate lots of complexity. Now, probably you can relate to this statement with various examples from your everyday life, but I would like to give you three formal examples of this fact. The first one are cellular automata. In this case, we have cells of two possible colors, black and white, and we have rules specifying that if three consecutive cells are black, then the cell underneath, in the middle, becomes white. If they are black, black, white, then the cell underneath becomes white. If they are black, white, black, it becomes white. If they are black, white, white, it becomes black. And so on for the other four possibilities of the upper three cells. Now, moreover, Imagine that we start with a very simple configuration. So please look at the top row here. So we have all cells which are white, except for the one in the middle, which is black. And now we will apply these rules in order to obtain the black-white configuration of the second row. And from that black-white configuration, we will apply again the rules to obtain the configuration of the third row, and so on. Okay, so we see that the black has spread into this form of a triangle, but it's unclear what's happening inside the triangle. So let us see what happens if we run this simulation for 500 steps. Well, in this case, we see that on the left-hand side, some regular patterns have appeared, but on the right-hand side, something very complicated seems to be going on. Well, in fact, this is really complex. This is as close to a random number as it gets in classical physics. So we have seen that these innocent-looking rules, together with a very simple initial configuration, has given rise to a remarkable amount of complexity. And this is just one example. Many more can be found in this book by Wolfram. Now, my second example comes from physics. In spin models, we have variables called spins, which can take two possible states, here denoted with an upward arrow and a downward arrow. They are like our previous black and white. Moreover, we have physical rules specifying that if two neighboring spins are in the same state, so they are both pointing upward or downward, then they get little energy. But if they are pointing in different directions, so upward, downward, or downward, upward, then this leads to more disorder. Now, you may know that physical systems tend to the state of minimal energy and maximal disorder, so there will be a competition between these two tendencies in order to align or misalign the spins. Imagine, moreover, that we place these spins on a grid. Now, whether minimizing the energy or maximizing the disorder wins will depend on the temperature of the system. Okay. But all of these details are, in fact, not important. What is important is that this spin model is simple, in the sense that the spins can only take two possible values, that the energy only depends on the state of two neighboring spins, and that the spins are placed on a grid. Now, the main point is that this simple spin model suffices to simulate all other spin models. This includes, in particular, way more complicated spin models, such as models where the spin can point in more directions, or where the energy depends on the state of four neighboring spins, or where the spins are placed on a three-dimensional grid, or on some more complicated geometries. Now, this is a homage to Pink Floyd, of course. Um, but so we see that this simple and 
innocent looking spin model on the left can in fact explore all complexity of spin models. And this is not only relevant for physics, but for all areas using um, spin models. And they are very popular as toy models of complex systems. So for example, they are used in artificial neural networks. My third example is from computer science. In this case, simple machines can run any algorithm. By simple, I mean that they use the encoding of information only relying on zeros and ones, and a fairly simple architecture of a machine, um, theoretically called a Turing machine. Now, naively, one would have expected that more complex algorithms need to run on more complex machines. But this is not what happens. This simple architecture, the Turing machine, is rich enough to run any possible algorithm. So why is this so? I mean, why is it the case that simple rules generate so much complexity? I believe that this is because they jump to universality. Let me explain that. Imagine that we plot the complexity of the rules on the horizontal axis, so that more complicated rules um, would be situated on the right of the diagram and simpler ones on the left. Now, imagine moreover that on the vertical axis, we plot the complexity of the system generated by these rules, so that more complicated systems would be on the upper side and simpler ones on the lower side. Now, naively, we expect some sort of proportionality relation between these two quantities, so that more complicated systems need more complicated underlying rules. Yet this is not what happens. What happens is that as rules become gradually more complex, they suddenly undergo a very large change of functionality called a jump to universality, after which they can explore all complexity in their domain. And in this talk, I will use the word universal to mean precisely this, the capability of exploring all complexity in a given domain. Now we can revisit the examples from before. First of all, the cellular automaton that I showed you, showed you at the beginning um, is known to be Turing complete. So it is universal and in this sense it can explore this very complex landscape. The simple spin models are also universal in the sense that they can simulate any other spin model. And Turing machines are universal in the sense that they can run any algorithm. Now, these three notions of universality, as well as others I didn't mention, have been independently discovered, but they share many similarities. And in our research group, we're trying to make these similarities precise so that we can go to the heart of the matter of universality. We are also trying to extend them to other questions or fields. In particular, uh, in biology, a simple code, DNA, underlies essentially all of life in the biosphere. Now, that does not mean that by understanding the code, one understands the complexity of the biosphere, that's plainly false, but perhaps some aspects of this perspective on universality can shed some light on some aspects of the very complex world of biology. And um, I love books, and so if you imagine your favorite poem or your favorite novel, and you think how it is possible to express all of those fantasies by just using a handful of symbols and of rules, well, that's quite astounding. Um, so we are also trying to investigate whether some aspects of universality um, can help us understand some aspects of linguistics. And this brings me to the question of why do systems jump to universality? Namely, why is our intuition wrong? What's really going on there? Where is the magic? And I believe that what's going on is that a hierarchy becomes entangled. Namely, imagine that we plot all possible rules 
in a given hierarchical level um, so that every point is a set of rules. Imagine, moreover, that uh, we draw the systems generated by these rules in another level so that, again, every point is a system. Now, a priori, the rules give rise to the system. They govern the system. So in this sense, the rules are in a higher hierarchical level than the system. Okay. So far, so good. This is the usual order of things. Now, all the magic comes in when, when these systems reach a certain level of complexity, they can suddenly be used to encode rules. Now, this allows rules to take as input the description of other rules and thereby simulate other rules. This is the key. This is how simple rules can behave as complicated ones because, because they just need to be able to read the description of some complicated rule and behave like it. At this point, the jump to universality happens. Now, this structure of a tangled hierarchy may seem fairly abstract to you, but in fact, I bet you've seen it before, namely in this drawing hands by Escher. Um, on the left-hand side of this picture, we see a hand drawing a calf, so the hand is in a higher hierarchical level than the calf. But the calf becomes alive and becomes a drawing hand itself, which is now in a higher hierarchical level than the calf of the very first hand. So this is a tangled hierarchy, and in fact, I've borrowed this phrase from this wonderful and very deep book, Gödel Escherbach by Hofstadter, where he shows that tangled hierarchies appear in Escher's paintings, as in this example, in Bach's music, namely in the structure of some of his compositions, and in the proof of Gödel's theorem. Now, Gödel's theorem is a very deep result in mathematics, um, showing that most statements are neither provable nor disprovable. They are undecidable. And I believe that undecidability is intimately connected to universality because they both share this underlying structure of a tangled hierarchy. We are also trying to make this precise in our research team. I would like to end by drawing two hopeful messages from these very abstract ideas. The first one is that the magic appears when a hierarchy disappears. In our everyday life, there are many hierarchies which are detrimental for progress and for well-being. Important examples are um, the patriarchy, racism, the oppression imposed by religion, or by any other authority claiming to have definitive knowledge about anything. We need to turn these hierarchies upside down, and we need to all have a say and all listen to each other. And this brings me to my final message, which is that a critical mind makes us people jump to universality um, in terms of our power to explain and transform the world. For most of our history, um, knowledge was given by authority, either political or religious. Um, yet at some point, we learned to have a critical mind and sustain it. This happened during the scientific revolution here in the West. Um, two basic principles, namely that problems are inevitable and that problems are solvable, triggered an, um, a revolution in our capability to transform the world and an open-ended generation of knowledge. And as David Deutsch would say, they put us at the beginning of infinity. <laughs>